Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you this morning out at Vantage Point. If you're out in the lobby, make your way this way. We're giving out $100 bills this morning, the first one minute of church. If you're not in here, you will not get one. And the troops come running in. <laughs> Charlotte, thank you so much. That's just what I needed. All right, everybody. My name is Pastor Dean. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Vantage Point Church. And uh, we love you, and we love the people of this city. And it is our desire to reach as many people with the love of Jesus Christ that we possibly can. If you're here today, and you have to decide whether you're here or not, I'm not sure, I can't be sure that you are, but if you think you are here today, there's a connection card for you. Everybody fills out one of these at our church, so you can fill that out. There's lots of opportunity for you to respond to things that are meaningful to you. So read through the card. There's a place for prayer requests or praise notes, or if you just want to pass a message along to the church office, you can do that there. There is a pen to do that, and you can keep that pen if you don't have a pen. Um, if you have 14 of these at home, would you bring 13 of them back? Because <laughs> these babies are really good pens, but they're expensive. So if, you're not, if you've got a bunch of pens at home and you're not using them, bring some of those back. We'll just recycle them and pass them on. I told you last Sunday, and if you weren't here last Sunday, many of you weren't, um, I was at the bank this week, at a different bank this week than I normally bank at, and while I was there filling out a slip, I looked down and the pen that I picked up was one of our pens. So whoever of you are leaving your, the pens at your bank, thank you. It makes a difference because you, people are doing what I did. Picked up the pen and said, hmm, vantage point. So uh, that's a really good thing. If you would like to give a financial donation, if you would like to uh, give your tithes and offerings here to vantage point today, this envelope is there for that purpose. Or if you have a check, you can just place it in the box on the back. And at the end of the service, your connection card can go in that box as well. And that will be uh, gathered up and we'll get those cards and respond to you. If you are looking for an opportunity to see what's going on, we have two ways for you this morning to be able to respond uh, and get more knowledge about Vantage Point. There is a URL code that comes up on the screen. It's a place where you can point your camera, hit the button. It'll take a picture of that online program and you have the church bulletin right there on your phone. I also have some printed copies back on the table this morning. I put 10 back there because there are five of you who wish we'd do away with all things digital and just do paper. So there are some copies back there. If you'd like to pick one up, uh, you have a paper copy for that. Thank you for coming to Vantage Point this morning. We believe that God has something real for us today. And so Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and change our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. I would like to invite everyone to stand and worship our good, good father this morning. Would you sing with us? I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm, I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. this morning, that our Father is good. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you can provide because you don't just what we You are perfect in all of your ways. You are 
Amen. 
your fire fall down. Lord, we just ask that you continue to hear as we worship you this morning, Lord. We thank you for this privilege and this honor, Lord, that we have to worship you, God. declare your truth this morning, Father, that you are good and that you are holy and that you are who you say you are, Father. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender. Our judge and our defender, suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glory as light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Sing, I believe.
I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're going to go and talk to God today. And I have to tell you this morning, uh, we're not really worthy to do that. The, the truth of the matter is this morning, God is so awesome and awe-inspiring and amazing and holy and perfect and good and righteous and right. He never goofs up. He never says anything wrong. He never does anything wrong. He always does what's right for his universe and for people and in the lives of people. And I have to be honest, I sometimes feel a little bit intimidated to go before God. Anybody else like that? Anybody ever feel intimidated to go to God? Because you realize, I don't really measure up. And that would be true. You don't really measure up, and I don't really measure up, until we understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. And so we're going to go before our Father this morning because he has opened the door. He is now our Papa, and he loves us, and he bids us to come and talk to him. And so we're going to do that now. Let's pray. God, we are literally overwhelmed by you. Standing before you, Father, feels so intimidating. It's worse than standing before the principal at school. It's worse than standing before the dean at university. It's worse than standing before the governor or even the president of the United States or the pope or the queen or anyone else. Standing before you, God, seems so... uh, that I almost could sit down and just say nothing and just sit. We could sit in silence and in awe of who you are. I would be afraid to come before you as Moses was afraid to come before you if it weren't for Jesus. But the Lord Jesus Christ has come. He is the second person of the Trinity. He came and emptied himself of that deity, some of those components of his deity that made him God in heaven, And he lived here among us, and he talked to us, and he taught us, and he loved us, and he showed us a better way, and then he died for us. And then, if that wasn't enough, then, through the supernatural power of God, the dead Christ rose to life again. And today he has power over sin, death, the judgment, the grave, and everything else. And the scripture teaches us in the book of Galatians, in the book of Galatians, that you are our father, you are Abba. You are daddy. You are papa. You have opened your arms to us today, and you invite us to come before you. And as we come, God, we are aware that we may be bringing before you some sins that we've committed this week. And Father, I pray that you would help us to do a little heart search, soul search moment here. And if something is coming to mind that that we just know it doesn't cut it, would we repent of that right now? Would we say, Father... I have sinned against you. Lord, I've sinned against some other people. And I am really sorry for that. I want my slate to be clean this morning as I come before you. I want to be able to lock eyes with you and not be uh, ashamed. So God, if we need to confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I thank you for that today. And I declare that based on the authority of the Word of God. Today, Lord, some of us are coming and we've had a wild week. Things have happened that were unexpected. Stuff has been going on in our world that has caused us to our head in disbelief, shake our head in anger, shake our fist maybe at you even, because we don't understand why. But God, as we come into your presence and sit with you this morning, we're aware that you're going to help us understand that you know what's best for us. And that you're working out all things together for good to those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. And so we have to rest in you for the things that happen to us and trust you that you know what you're doing. 
In a moment, Lord, we're going to celebrate the babies in our church. There are many more who couldn't be here today, but for those who are here, God, we want so much for those children and those parents to know just how much Vantage Point loves them. We're committed to them. We've made a commitment to them. Even as late as last evening, as I did some figuring and early this morning, I discovered that even with our new summer program that's coming up, about 50% of our people are volunteering in that, and I'm just thrilled by that. I pray, Father, for those few final positions in our, our Vantage Point Cave Quest event this summer, that we'd find those few people that some of us who have been holding back would not hold back anymore, that today would be the day where we would sign up and say, I'm going to do my part to help the children of this church know that they're loved and to know that God loves them. So God, this is your church. We're your people. We believe you have great things in store for us today, and we love you more than words can say. In your strong name I pray. Amen. Turn that Okay. Well, I would like to welcome you to our second annual Vantage Point Baby Parade. This is a small sampling of some of the wonderful babies that we have that hang out with me in the back in the nursery. And if you have any interest in volunteering, you can see me after. <laughs> All right, we are going to get started. If you'll, if you'll turn your attention, you'll see our contestants this morning. Oh, aren't they beautiful? Up first, we have Renee Marie Sorrell. Renee comes to us from West Glens Falls. She is two months old. She likes to drink milk. She loves to play with her puppy, Annabelle. But best of all, she likes snuggles with mom and dad. Everybody give a quiet round of applause for Renee. Up next, we have Eli Howell. Eli is two years old. He loves to sing. You'll find him playing outside from dawn until dusk. But best of all, he loves to hang out with his grampy. Give a big round of applause for Eli from Queensbury. And our final contestant of the after of the morning, sorry, is Navea. Navea is ten months old. She likes to watch Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. But her favorite mouse couture is her godfather, David. Give a quiet round of applause for Navea. This concludes our parade for this evening. We thank you for coming. And this parade was brought to you by Vantage Point Church, Cave Quest VBA, and the Children's Ministry. Make sure all contestants get their prizes after. Church, if you want to head out to Kids Church, it is that time now for Kids Church. We have some interesting things that go around that, that go on in the church during the week here. And one of the interesting things that we've had happening here at the church is this door casing over here. This door casing over here is an amazing door casing. It looks very, uh, oh, just uninteresting, just sitting here on the wall. It doesn't mean much to you or to me, but uh, don't take it for granted. Of, about a month ago, Rose, Pastor Rosalie had gone in there to do something, and she had her hand on that metal casing, and then she reached over and flipped the light switch off. And as she did that, she got 120 volts that just, 
It was so intense that she, it was hard for her to let go of the door casing and the light switch. You know how that is? And uh, so we've all been really scared of that door. I don't go near there because I don't want to die. So I stay clear of that. We had tape, oh, police tape and all that stuff over it. Do not enter tape so no one would touch that. But this week uh, we got that fixed. It was amazing. The electrician came in and he took his meter and he touched the light switch. And then he touched the side of the casing. He said, oh, there's nothing here. He touched the other side of the casing. He said, oh, there's nothing here. Then he reached up and touched the top of the casing, and there was 120. And he said, there is something here. So he took it apart, and when the original building was built, somebody drove a nail through uh, the, top of, in the top of the door and nailed it right into the wire. Now, don't ask me why it took all these years for it to come to life. But it was just in time for Pastor Rose Lee to get a shock. Okay, But it is fixed now. It's fixed now. The thing that I liked about it was, he thought about what he needed to do first before he acted. If it had been me doing that, I'd have torn the casing all out and made a mess of it before I would have found the problem. But he thought it through. And this morning, and then he fixed it. I want you this morning to think about what I'm talking about. I want you to think about what I'm going to share with you from God's Word this morning. I think you'll find after you've thought about it that you'll feel confident in being able to take action on what we say. The title of my message this morning is Satisfaction Guaranteed. Now, satisfaction guaranteed, that's a big statement. I understand that. Satisfaction guaranteed. I got an email this week from Starbucks. Uh, I go to Starbucks from time to time, and from Starbucks trying to get me to go back again, because I haven't been there in a long time. Financial Peace University ruined me for Starbucks, so I don't go there anymore. But anyways, they said, if you'll come back to Starbucks and buy a drink, any drink, we're going to give you a free breakfast sandwich. So I bought an $1.89, $1.89 coffee, and then I got a free sandwich, which was great. Now, if they had said to me in the email, listen, it's satisfaction guaranteed. If you come and eat this sandwich, you will be so overwhelmed that you'll come here every morning and eat the sandwich. You know what I would say? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. And when I say this morning that in Jesus Christ, you can experience satisfaction guaranteed, you might say to yourself, uh, is that just preacher talk? Is that just church talk? Is that just trying to get an offering out of me? Like, what's the big deal? Well, I just want you to know this morning that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you trust his word, I can promise you this, you will be satisfied. God can meet the deepest need of your heart. God can transform the way you think. God can change your outlook about life, about yourself, about other people, and about the world. But you need to understand God's plan and purpose for our world. And so this morning, I have a PowerPoint for you. This is the PowerPoint. You need to understand this morning that every one of us needs a Savior. Every one of us. You say, why, Pastor Dean, why? The reason is because every single one of us, right to the last person, to the youngest, to the oldest, the reality is that every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because we have sinned against God and fallen short of the glory of God, I hate to tell you this, but you're in trouble, and I'm in trouble. And so we need a Savior this morning because we've fallen short of God's plans and purposes for us. You say, Pastor Dean, where did it all get started? Why are we having this trouble today? Why do we need a Savior today? Well, I want you to listen to a story from the Old Testament, the book of Genesis and the third chapter, and this is what the Bible says. It's the biblical story of how sin entered the world. Now the serpent, who was Satan, was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to him, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, oh, You will not surely die, or you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. Isn't that everybody's desire? You will be like God knowing good from evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. 
Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig trees together and leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Ah, oh, but notice what happened. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever done something that you knew you shouldn't do, and all of a sudden you think about God? What do you want to do? The last thing you want to do when you're doing something you know God doesn't want you to do is to go to church. The last person you want to run into on Tuesday when you've just really messed up bad and you're not living the way God wants you to live, the last person you want to run into is me. Okay? So let me ask you, Dave, how's your spiritual life going? You're like, will he go somewhere else? Will he go grab the door casing or something? Because I really don't want, I really don't want to talk about it because I'm not where I need to be. I was that way with my mother. When I, would, when I would do something I shouldn't do, I would run and hide, and I would hear mom coming, and I'd like, oh, I hope she passes on by and doesn't bother me. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said to him, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, well, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Just like a man, right, ladies? Just blame the wife, blame the wife. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel. By the way, that is a prophetic statement about Jesus Christ. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you will bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And out of the dust you were taken, and to the dust you shall return. Now that's an interesting story. It's a story about two people who had an opportunity to make a wise choice, but chose not to do it. And they ended up sinning against God. And what is the consequence of them disobeying God and sinning? Well, the Bible says the Lord sent them out of the garden. He drove the man out of the garden to the east of the garden. He placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God said, because you've sinned against me, you've lost the opportunity to be able to live forever the way I had set it up for you. Now, Adam and Eve have sinned. They've been tossed out of the garden. They're going around. They know they were naked now. They've got to have clothes. They've got to go. Ladies, they have to go shoe, Eve had to go shoe shopping all the time. You know, it's a curse. I know. It's a terrible curse. But that's what happened. You say, but really, what's the big deal? I mean, they just, they just disobeyed God, and they didn't listen to God. And Why do we get all excited about this story? Well, because it, sin has an impact upon you that you don't realize. It weakens you. It brings things to you that you never expected to come your way. Sin has a terrible impact on the family. You don't believe me? Look at the next chapter, Genesis 4. Here's how sin impacted our race. Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the fruit of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, listen to this part, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel, and he killed him. You say, sin has no impact. Sin doesn't really hurt anybody. It's just between me and God. It doesn't really hurt anybody. 
Adam and Eve could have said that too, but the reality was sin ended up causing one of their boys to kill one of the other boys. And the boy who did the murdering was sent away from the presence of his parents and of God. You see this morning, sin knows no boundaries. Sin touches the mightiest of the land, and it touches the humblest of the land. Sin has impact in your life and in my life like no other thing in all of the universe. Sin will destroy us. There's a story in the Bible about a king. He had everything that he wanted. He had everything you could desire in life. And yet look at how sin impacted him. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, King David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Kings were supposed to go fighting with their armies in those days, but David didn't fight with the army. He decided this time he was going to stay home and take it easy. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. I could stop and preach a sermon on that. He was supposed to be at work. He was goofing off at home, and the neighbor's wife was out in her yard in her bikini, if we could bring it up to modern terms, and David sat there. Instead of going inside and looking at a picture of his wife, he looked at her. <clears throat> you know the rest of the story. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house. A woman conceived and sent word and told David, I am pregnant. So at this point, David says, Oh my land, I've sinned against God and against this woman and her husband. I'm going to confess my sins before God. No. So David sent word to Joab, the head of the army, Send me Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When David came to him, David asked Joab how he was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. David was not a podiatrist. He did not care about Uriah's feet. What he cared about was covering his, can I say this in church? He was interested in covering his butt because he sinned against Uriah and it's Uriah's wife. And now she was pregnant with David's child. And David thought, if I bring him back from the field and send him to her, he'll lay with her. And then, he, then they can blame him for having the child. And no one will ever know that David did wrong. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah says to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths in the fields, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field, shall I go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, O king, and as your sons live, I will not do this thing. Uriah was more righteous than David. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here another day and tomorrow, and I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, and David made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. David now tries to get him drunk so he'll go and lay with his wife. And he's, even in his drunken stupor, he's more righteous than David, who was sober. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and said, sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah at the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. David the sweet singer of Israel, the Lord's representative for all the land, stays home instead of being responsible, stays home, has sex with another guy's wife, tries to get the, wife to, the, the husband to, to go lie with the wife to cover his tracks. He can't do it. So to make matters worse, instead of confessing his sins, he has him killed. Wow, what a great king. What a great king. And then the Bible says, the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, and she lamented over him. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But then Scripture ends the passage this way. 
But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. You see, I think to myself, I can do this little thing and nobody will know. And I'll get away with it. And everything will be fine. No, no, no. But when we sin against the Lord and against others, just what it says here, the things that we do displease the Lord. And God knows. God doesn't forget. God doesn't miss anything. God remembers. And so David, the king of the land, had committed sin against others, and he was guilty. Now, David eventually responded to this problem, and he confessed his sin. Listen to this, this psalm that David wrote about this time. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. God, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Why, God? Be for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. David says, everywhere I go, I see Uriah's face. Every time I go into the palace where the women are, I see Bathsheba and I'm reminded. Every time I hear my baby cry, I'm reminded of the fact that I, that I got that baby through sin and that I killed his, his uh, mother's father, or his, or mother's, his mother's husband for it. David says, it's always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, God, and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, Lord, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inner being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice again. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. God, it's everywhere I go, this sin, and would you please take it away from me? Would you remove it from me? And then David prays a prayer that we should all memorize because we should be quoting this prayer regularly too. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God, go to the heart of the matter, which is my wicked heart, and deal with my heart. Clean it up. Make it right so that I, do, I will not sin against you. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. You see, David's problem is clear. David knew that he had done wrong. And in David's day, the only thing he could do was to offer a sacrifice take an animal, a living animal, slit its throat, drain the blood, offer the sacrifice before God. That was God's way of being able to deal with the sin problem. There was only one problem with that. There was no lasting solution. The day that David offered that sacrifice for the forgiveness of his sins, it was wonderful. He was clean. The only problem was the next day came and David was tempted again. And this time, what did he do? Could he go back and offer another? Well, well, he would have to. There was no lasting solution for sin. No, no lasting solution for sin today either. For those people who will not look to God. People carry the weight of their sin on their shoulders every day, everywhere they go. They're like a pack mule trying to climb Mount Everest to get to God. How many times have you felt like, I can't pray right now, I can't read my Bible right now, because I've got a sin problem and I need help. The solution is found in someone special, and let me share that with you in just a moment. Humanity needs a better solution than the Moses solution. And so God responds to our need. Listen to Matthew chapter 3. In, the days John the, in, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of hair, camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptizing him in the river, Jordan, confessing their sins. Bye, baby. It's okay. We weren't, you didn't bother us. But listen to this. People were coming and confessing their sins. 
they weren't even offering a lamb or a bull or anything. They were just coming and confessing their sins. But then John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism. He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, if you're going to repent, change the way you live. Hmm, novel thought. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God's able of these stones to raise up children for Abraham. I baptize you with water for repentance, John says, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And then I love the next verse. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented Jesus saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. Then Jesus was baptized, and immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said to G of Jesus, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. No hope. Carry my sin all day long, all through my life. Come to the end of my life in David's day. Come to the end of my life and hope that I make heaven my home. And then Jesus comes to Galilee. And he's the Lamb of God, the Bible says, who takes away the sins of the world. God, you see, saw the plight of humanity and said, I am going to deal with the problem once and for all. And so God gave his very best effort, his very best gift, so that you and I could deal with the sin that separates us from a relationship with God. Here, John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, is Jesus. He came to this world. As I said in my prayer, he lived here, he loved here, he taught here, he died here, and he rose again. And he came into the world not to condemn you for your sin, not to condemn me for our, my sin, but to deliver me from my sin, to forgive me for my sin, to restore me, within me a clean heart. I don't know about you, but I want that. I want that. Now God shows himself to sinful people, and they respond. You see, it's one thing for God to say, I've sent Jesus into the world, but if, if it's just an intellectual fact that Jesus came into the world, there's no power in it. It's just knowledge. It's just history. But Jesus acted on what he came to do in John chapter 4. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it wasn't true, he left Galilee and departed again, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Yeah, the same Samaria that you know about today. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, weary as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. This is the good part. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink? For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying this to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you've got nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water you're talking about? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself. Jesus said to her, 
Everyone who drinks of this physical water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him, he will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and have to come to draw water. Have you ever been thirsty for God? Let me put it this way, or ask it this way. Have you ever been thirsty for a change in life? Have you ever said to yourself, if things don't change, I'm going to crack up, or if things don't change, I'm out of here? Ever said that? I have. Sin will make you long for things, something that you don't really need. Sin causes you to want, desire things that you shouldn't have. Sin tries to trick you into believing that if you'll just buy into that stuff, then your life will be okay and you'll be satisfied. But it's a lie because sin cannot give you what you really need. And because what we really need is the living water of God. The Holy Spirit who comes into our life and fills us, forgives us of our sins and cleanses our hearts and gives us a new mind to please God. Well, let's go on. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and have to come here to draw again. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one who you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. I don't know if you can appreciate this, but it's like you sitting down with someone at Starbucks and there's a bunch of people around. You're sitting there at Starbucks and you're talking and the, and the, the person who's across from you, you know, would you like a coffee? Yeah, I'll have a coffee. And, all this and then all of a sudden you start talking. The person in a loud voice says, oh, and by the way, I know what you did last night. You say, uh, uh, excuse me, you, you, you know what I did last night? Oh, uh, yes. And then he goes on to explain in graphic detail what you did the night before that you shouldn't have done. I don't know what it is. What do you do at night you shouldn't do? But all of a sudden, he's broadcasting it out for the whole restaurant here. How would you feel? I'd feel terrible. I'd feel embarrassed. I wouldn't want him to do that. That's what Jesus was, Jesus was making the woman look at a, in the mirror of herself and say, you were trying to act like, I just don't have a husband. When actually you've had five husbands and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. And I am pointing out your sin for you to see. She says to him, what you have said, or he says to her, what you've said is true. And the woman says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Jesus says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem you'll worship the Father. Ah, the hour is coming is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You know what the fact is this morning? You can't be who you need to be. And you can't have a guaranteed, satisfied experience unless you have Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. Seriously. A friend of mine posted on Twitter yesterday. He said, being a Christian is not about checking a box on this card. On the front it says, I prayed to receive Christ as my Savior and I want to be baptized. People are checking that box here at Vantage Point all the time, saying, I, I, I prayed a prayer, I receive God. But, but my friend went on to say, checking a box is not what makes you a Christian. Taking up your cross and following Jesus is what makes you a Christian. And you see, for a lot of us, we, we want just enough of God, just enough of God, so that when we're in church, we don't feel guilty. Come on, come on, we do. I do too, you know. I'm coming to church, it's Saturday night, and it's Sunday morning comes, and you know, if I, if I barked at Rosalie and bit her head off over something, you know, I, I honey, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, because I have to go to church, I have to be religious. So, oh God, I, you know, I said then, that I'm sorry God, because I'm going to church, and I have to be religious. God says, it's not about checking off a box on a card, it's about surrendering your life to me and living your life for me. That's what a Christian does. So God's plan was a good plan. We don't have to offer bulls and goats anymore for our salvation. 
Jesus Christ has come into the world. He died on a cross. He changed the world forever. And now there's new opportunity. Listen to God's plan. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you have been saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Here it is. For I delivered to you, people at Vantage Point, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture. Do you have a sin problem this morning? The Bible says Jesus died because of your sins and for your sins. And he was buried. And he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. And he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, both of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me, the least of all the apostles. Here's the truth. Jesus Christ wants you and wants me to know that we can be fully satisfied. That satisfaction is guaranteed if we will deal with the sin issue and the lordship issue in our lives. If we are dealing with sin, yes, we feel bad, we feel ashamed. But you don't have to carry it around. You can get on your knees, or you can ride in your car, or you can walk around your property, or you can, I don't know what you do to get alone with God, but whatever you need to do, you can go to God and say, God, I am messing this thing up, and I need help. Would you please deal with what makes me want to do wrong? Will you cleanse my heart and forgive me of my sins? And so we have to respond to these things, the Bible says. Second Peter chapter 3, this is what Peter says. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all. The scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing on as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. What does all that mean? God's, Peter says, there was a time when the world was lost in sin. And the only way God could deal with it was to send the flood. You remember that guy Noah and the ark and all that stuff? I believe that really happened. I know, I know, paint me as a screwball. But God dealt with sin that way then. How does God deal with it now? God sent his son to die upon the cross and rose again so that we could be sure that our sins could be cared for once and for all, that we could live the Christian life. But just as God dealt with the world by water then, one day God will deal with the world by fire. And all the sin that sin has wreaked havoc with will be destroyed by that fire in the day of judgment. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the Lord, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And I love this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but He is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Repentance is when I recognize my sin. I recognize I need a Savior. Repentance gives me the oppor- is a great word because it gives me an opportunity to turn away from my sins, to confess them to God, and to turn away from my sins. And every one of us today, if satisfaction is really going to be what we enjoy in life, we're going to have to deal with the sin issue once and for all. It's got to be dealt with. And the only way it can be dealt with is by you asking Christ, the gift of God, to come into your life, by a supernatural transaction to cleanse your heart of the sin that is there, and, once he does that, to make you a new person from the inside, which will work its way out. For many years, 
what many of us have tried to do is clean up the outside first. You know, get a haircut. This is how it was in my day. I was one of those long-haired hippie guys. I know it's hard to believe now, but I was. And I remember the day I went to get my haircut. God was working in my life, and I, and I thought, I've got to clean my act up for God. And so I went down to the local barbershop, and the, my long, long hair, I got cut up really, really short. And I'm walking out of the barbershop, walking toward home, and Dad's coming down the street. Uh, Dad, I don't know if you remember this, but he's coming down the street, and Dad looks up, and he walks right past me. He didn't even recognize me. Looked right at me, didn't even recognize me, because I now have a short haircut where I always had that long, awful hair that I'd had before. I thought he would be pleased with that. And he was eventually. He was just in shock. I thought if I cleaned up my hair, then God would receive me, and I wouldn't be doing the bad things that I was doing. And someone had to sit me down and say, Son, listen, it's nice that you're cleaning up your act. You needed to get a haircut. But the fact of the matter is that haircut will not fix the problem. The problem is found in receiving the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I knelt at an altar of prayer, and I asked God to forgive me of my sins. And I invited him to be, come into my life and be Lord of my life. And it was my intention from that point on to live for Christ, to take up my cross and follow him. It's not enough, folks, to check the box. If your life doesn't show a change, then the change has not happened. So whenever you need help, you can run with confidence to your Heavenly Father's throne room. He longs to forgive and restore you to himself. Jesus died for you so that you can release the burden of sin today and you can live your life in him. So, would you take time throughout your day to ask God for help? When Satan attacks you, like he did Adam and Eve and David and many others in Scripture, when he attacks you, run to God's throne. Go to where God is and allow God to satisfy you. Here's what I've learned. When I allow God to satisfy the longings of my heart, the, the, the longings and desires of the world seem very small and puny in comparison. When I walk away and ignore the blessings of God and how God wants to satisfy my life, and I try to find my pleasure and my joy and my satisfaction in the things of the world, it's kind of like a rotten apple. You know, it looks good on the outside, but when you take a bite of it and you start chewing on it, then you realize there are two worms in it. Blah. That's how the world is. Two worms in every bite. It's lots of protein, but it's not good for you. Okay? It's not good for you. So if you come against, up against a wall in your life, ask God to show you how you can climb over it. The promise is that God is always with us by his Holy Spirit. He longs to help us deal with our sin issues. He longs to pour out his unlimited grace and his love into our hearts. And so we should not live for today, but we should live God's way each and every day. We should seek his help in every situation and follow his leadership and whatever he asks us to do. And here's the thing. When we do that, we have satisfaction guaranteed. May God help us. Let's pray. Lord, <clears throat> I tried to just let the Bible speak today. I didn't try to explain it. I didn't try to illustrate it too much. I just wanted the Bible to speak. We looked at Adam and Eve who brought this mess upon us. And we could just blame them, but the fact of the matter is we do wrong every day when we know we shouldn't. So Adam and Eve are just as guilty as we are, and we're just as guilty as they are. We looked at David, who all looked good on the outside, but inside he was just a, just a common adulterer and murderer. He needed God. That's what he needed. And then we come into the New Testament, and there's John the Baptist, this crazy-looking guy who's out on the street, you know. He'd be holding up a sign saying, Repent, turn from your sins. We'd ignore him today. But thank God of the message that he brought, that there's one coming who's greater than I, who will be the Savior of the world. And that Savior is Jesus, who today has died on the cross, has rose again, is in heaven now, is praying for every one of us in this service. And he's praying and pleading with the Father that the Father would touch our hearts and, 
if we have not dealt with the sin issues of our day and of our hearts, that we would deal with them now. Maybe, Lord, we could pray a prayer something like this. God, I've walked with you, some for many years. Some are new Christians. But Lord, I've been walking with you, and, and I know what you've done for me, and I know what the Bible says, and I'm really grateful for all the blessings that I have in my life, but God, I just have this sin thing that keeps plaguing me. It's beleaguer- I'm beleaguered by it. I need help. The truth of the matter is today, help is available if we'll but ask. And so we ask you, Lord, today to cleanse our hearts from sin. If we know you, and yet we're living in a backslidden state, may today be the day when I say, Oh God, I hate this. I want a different way. And we would humble our hearts before you and let you forgive us and cleanse us. If we've never met you as our Savior, and we know that we're separated from God, Today is the day for us to walk right up to the throne room and say, and to lay out before God and say, God, forgive me a sinner. Invite me into your family and help me to find the satisfaction that I'm longing for. If we will take one step toward you, as the old timer said, you will take the rest of the steps to us and you will forgive us and you will cleanse us and you will help us each and every day. And for that, Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I don't know how for you to tell me about it. You can do it on the card. You can write something on the card to let me know you prayed that prayer. If you invited Christ into your life, you can check that box. Here's the only thing. After all I said about the box, if you check the box, make sure you follow up and make the changes. That you take up your cross. Because I'm concerned, guys. I'm concerned these days. There are so many people checking little boxes, but they're not living out the life. And that's not good enough. You're going to get hurt if you think you're safe and you're really not. You need to do business with God, and I need to do business with God. So God being our helper, helper, we can do that. Talk to me. Talk to me. I'm here to talk to you if you want to share. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Dean. We're going to close out the service with one more song. Um, This is a new one. Uh, So some of you might have heard it on the radio before. It's called It Is Well, um, but it's a rendition from the original hymn, It Is Well, from the 1870s. Um, And it's about a gentleman, a businessman, who who lost basically everything. Um, He lost his finance due to a terrible, terrible fire. He lost... um, four of his daughters on a ship as they were crossing over um, a great body of water. And, and as he was passing to visit his wife, he was just there and he was in the middle of this vast ocean. And he calls out and he writes this hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And it is this unbelievable challenge to me that, oh my goodness, the, the depth of this man's relationship with with his creator and the depth of his relationship with the Lord um, is to the point where he can say, Lord, this world has taken everything from me, but God, it is well with my soul because you are still good and you are still sovereign and you are still a provider even when everything else around me is falling apart. Um, And And this song was a really wonderful song to sing when you have that peace with Christ. And and it just speaks of his glory of saying, you know, Lord, things have happened in the past, but Lord, one thing that hasn't changed is who you are and your character and your goodness. And my prayer for you this morning is as we sing this song, that for those of you who truly have a relationship with Christ, that you experience this peace. And for those of you who are absolutely brand new, we're so happy you're here. can desire that peace that comes from knowing the Lord this deeply. Um, So it is well, I'm going to invite you to stand, but feel free to sit if you'd like. It could be either or. Sing the song along with me. Sound 
Father's voice And the seas that are shaken and stirred Will be calm and broken for my regard
coming on. Before I knew Christ, I loved the summer better than any other season of the year because there was so much evil that I could get into in the summer. You know, there's just so much going on in the summer. No snow to hinder me. I could run around and be the worst person I could be because, hey, it was summer. This is the last Sunday before July and before, you know, kind of official summer begins in a way. And I'm just thinking that wouldn't this be a great time to get right with God before the summer comes? Listen, guys, there's a lot of trouble to get into this summer. Ladies, there's lots of trouble to get into this summer. And wouldn't it be great if just this last Sunday of June, if we just dealt with the sin issue once and for all in our lives? We just said, I'm tired of doing this. I'm going to go God's way. I want to get my heart right with God. I'm going to do this thing so that I, so my summer can count for God. <clears throat> I've had concern that we can't get the volunteers we need for VBA. And I've been thinking it's because you're busy, you got too much to do, and you're the fear of uh, maybe missing out on something, so you're not going to say yes to volunteer because something else may come up. But I got thinking, maybe we all have heart issues. Because there are, there are going to be 125 or 140 kids who are going to be coming to this building from our community who need Jesus, and we can't get the volunteers we need? Well, wait a minute, something something's wrong here. When my heart is right with God, I want to serve Him. And what better way to serve than to serve those little children who will be coming into this building in a couple of weeks? So will you deal with God? Will you deal with your heart? We deal with your service today. Let's pray. Is there anybody who would say, Pastor Dean, you've been preaching at me? And just lift up your hand for a minute. I can hardly see you because of the lights, but I'm going to do this. That your God is helping you deal with some sin issues? Yes! Amen. Anybody else? It's okay to say I'm dealing with sin issues. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. God sees your hand. Even if no one else does, God sees your hand. God we have thrown ourselves upon your mercy this morning. We need your grace. We need your forgiveness and your love. We need your cleansing and the fix that will change our heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. We need you to change our hearts so that we willingly volunteer to make a difference in the lives of people. I pray, God, as we reach out to you, that you will take our hands and you will pull us close, and you'll wrap your arms around us, and you'll say, I love you, I forgive you, I cleanse you, and I'm here to walk with you. Do it by your Holy Spirit, and we will be responsive. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for coming to Vantage Point today. God bless you.